sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive its sinful man. Make the map sits clear and plain. Christ receive its sinful man. Come and he will give you rest. Christ in for his word is plain. He will take the sinful list. Christ receive it sinful men. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive it sinful men. Make the men sits clear and plain. Christ receive it sinful men. Now my heart condemns me not. Here before the law I sat, he who cleansed me from all spot, satisfied his last demand, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive, fit sinful man, make the message clear and plain. Christ receive it sinful man. Christ receive it sinful man. Even me with all my sin. Purge from every spot and stain. Heaven with him I enter in. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive Sinful man, make the man sits clear and plain. Christ receive it, sinful man. Amen. All right. None of us, and I'm thankful that he died on that cross for us. And thankfully gave his life. All right, Grace family, this is your chance to make our guests feel welcome. What we're going to do, I know normally we get out in the aisle, but I don't think it's going to work today. So uh, look around look around your seat, find a face you've never seen before, a family you've never met, and uh, shake their hand, let them know you're glad they're here. Amen? All right, everyone, grab your hymn book back, turn to page 175. Let's sing, Tis So Sweet, to trust in Jesus, all right? Page number 175, grab your red hymn book. All righty, let's pick up that first verse now. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know that saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more, Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just His simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin itself to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, hope for grace. Let's hit the last now. I'm so glad I've learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Remain standing. prayer. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us, the blessings you bestowed upon us, and we thank you for what you've done for us today, Father. We thank you for the day you've blessed us with. Lord, I pray you touch this service today, Lord. We've got a house full of people today. Lord, no doubt people here that need some help, Lord, need some peace and some comfort. Lord, no doubt we've got people in our midst, Lord, that are lost, Lord, they've never put their faith and trust in you, God. Lord, I pray you'd convict them today, Lord, show them their need of a Savior. Lord, I thank you for those that have come today. Lord, I pray you touch the singing that's about to take place. Lord, I pray you touch those that are here today. Touch Brother Sean as he brings the message you've laid on his heart. Lord, give him clarity of speech and clarity of mind. Lord, freedom in the pulpit to say what you'd have him to. Lord, I pray you just bless us today. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die on that cross and give his life for us. Lord, as unworthy as we are, God. Lord, we didn't deserve it, Lord, but you've done it anyways because you love us. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. was not the path I would have chosen. I could see no hope from where I stood. Even though I knew what God had promised, I didn't see how he could work it for my good. Yet the road where pain was my companion took me to an unexpected place and standing in the middle of the darkness that was where my heart would learn to say i choose christ when everything around me says give up i choose faith i choose trust to believe he is good he'll come through like he said he would every time oh i choose christ i don't know the story he's unfolding but i know in his will he has a plan so every day my prayer is to surrender, even when it's hard to understand. I choose Christ when everything around me says give up. I choose faith, I choose to trust, to believe he is good. 
He'll come through like he said he would every time. Oh, I choose Christ. His grace is sufficient, whatever happens in my life. I've made my decision, no matter what the price. I choose Christ. sit alone the creator of the angels and everything that is come to where I was made me one of his 
I am overwhelmed by the grace that I've received. And the more I try to understand, the more I just can't see why he would ever love me, why he would give his son just to die for me, knowing who I was, he'd take up his cross and rescue me, undeserving as I am, I will never understand. He would ever love me. I was an enemy of God, dead in my sin. Oh, but I was made alive when He worked within. Need of nothing I could give Him, still His grace would reach for me. When he saved my soul, he saved my life, he changed everything. When I look into the scriptures, every time I read all the wonders of Jehovah, this is greatest mystery. Why he would ever love me, that he He would ever love me. I was an enemy of God, dead in my sin. Oh, but I was made alive when He worked within. Need of nothing I could give Him, still His grace would reach for me. When he saved my soul, he saved my life, he changed everything. When I look into the scriptures, every time I read all the wonders of Jehovah, this is greatest mystery. Why he would ever love me, that he so glad he loved me that he gave his son just to die for me knowing who I was he took up his cross and rescued me undeserving as I am I would never understand but I'm so glad he loved me. Second verse says, Of the wonders of Jehovah, this is greatest mystery that he would ever love me. That Bible, 66 books. Full of things we'll never understand. But Brother Alex, the greatest mystery in there is why he'd ever love a sinner like me. 
Why he'd ever love a sinner that was going to turn his back on him. But I'm so glad he loved me. Amen. I'm so glad he gave his life for us. While they come down, sing this chorus with me if you know it. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. It's going to be a good day, amen. Good morning. It is good to have all of you with us. Amen. It's good to have uh, uh, a multitude of my family with us this morning. Uh, Brother Zach told me, he said, y'all, y'all took up a quarter of the church. I said, amen. I appreciate them uh, coming, coming to grace this morning. Amen. Amen. And for those of you that are visitors this morning, thank you for uh, taking the opportunity to come and be with us in church. Amen. Uh, we count it an honor and a privilege that you would take time to come to this place. Amen. Uh, we are grateful for your uh, your presence and you being here. Amen. And we hope the Lord does something for you this morning. Amen. All right. If you have a Bible, open up to the book of Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. We've been in the book of Galatians for several weeks now. This This chapter specifically. We'll begin reading in verse number 16 here in a few moments. May I say I appreciate you ladies for those songs. Amen. That was a great blessing. It stirred my heart. Amen. I won't forget Brother Tyler. Thank you for playing piano, Brother Tyler. Amen. Amen. I'll give credit to whom credit is due. Amen. Amen. Unless your head gets puffed up, then we'll, we'll do something different. Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter number 5. And verse number 16 is where we'll begin our reading. I'll give you some context. Some con- context verses. And we'll, our message will essentially be out of verses 22 through verse 26. But to give some understanding, we'll read from verse 16 down through the remainder of the chapter. The Bible says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you. In time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now I read many of those verses just to give you an, an idea as to the context of the of our core verses we'll deal with this morning found in verses 22 through verse number 26. But what we understand from uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul is this, as he wrote these things, he was given a clear understanding that there is a separation between the flesh and the spirit. Now we all understand uh, that our flesh is our physical body that we uh, that we dwell in. It is that that has the the desires. It is that that we feed. It is that which uh, carries out the uh, the emotions of the body. And what we understand is this: that that is separate from that which is within us, being that spirit or that Holy Spirit uh, that is in the in the that indwells the believer at the moment of salvation. What we understand is this, that those two, they never really get along. 
You'll never find an opportunity or a time in which the flesh and the spirit will get along because they are always wa- uh, working in different areas and different things. Uh, what you'll see is that they are at enmity. They are at war with each other. And those of you that have strove or tried to live a godly life, you understand this because your flesh has warred against you in that uh, in that uh, work in you striving to live for the Lord. And so what we understand is this, that these things, they never get along. Now, as you got to verse number 19, what we found is this, that the uh, the works of the flesh have some very... Uh, sinful ideas and sinful things uh, that they carry out in this life and we dealt with those last week Uh, but when you get to the fruit of the spirit in verse number 22 what you find is that there is a great distinction between the things of God and the things of the flesh Uh, what you see is this that the characteristics of the spirit are much different than the characteristics of the flesh Uh, when you look at the works of the flesh uh, they are full of sin adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness, uh, lasciviousness and that laundry list found in verses 19 through 21 of things that even the world would say are evil things and but by the way that is that is the work that our flesh does those are the desires of the flesh the flesh desires to do evil and the desires to do uh, to do wicked things but uh, thanks be to God that there is a uh, uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside the heart of the believer at the moment of salvation that brings about a change in our lives or it is supposed to friend of mine and so let's dive into this uh, this simple message if we live in the Spirit. Now let's look number one uh, found in verses 22 and 23 at a conjunction that differentiates uh, between the previous works. Those works of the flesh that we've already talked about in verses 19 through 21. But as you come down to verse number 22 what you find is that there is a conjunction there uh, that begins this. And so what you're seeing is that there is a change that has occurred. What is about to be explained is far different than what you found in the previous verses. For what we find in verse 22 and 23 is this it is the fruit of the spirit now as you look in your Bible you'll see that that word spirit is capitalized now as the Apostle Paul was writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit what we understand is this that that word spirit is capitalized for a reason for he is referencing the Holy Spirit of God now this Holy Spirit he takes up an indwelling in the heart of the believer it is that which seals a believer until the day of redemption uh, when they get born again Uh, but there are some aspects and some attributes that come from him living inside of you may I say this there is a list that is mentioned in verses 22 and 23 that is a list that is that you are incapable of performing outside of the uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit taking up an abode inside of your heart. You say, what do you mean by that? What I mean is this, that if the Holy Spirit does not take up an indwelling inside of your heart, you cannot bring forth these, uh, these characteristics or this fruit of the Spirit in your life. You must be born again. That is the key to these fruit. Uh, to this fruit being a part of your life. We see a conjunction that differentiates. Let's look at a change of course. The works of the flesh that we dealt with last week, this this is the conduct of the natural man. Now, as I mentioned the natural man, what I'm referencing, I'm referencing an individual that has never been born again. They have never been saved. Uh, You are in the place of Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 in which you cannot understand spiritual things because you are a natural individual. Now, we understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 uh, that that is uh, a reference to the natural man not being able to understand understand spiritual things uh, because they are spiritually discerned and what that means is this that uh, the spiritual things uh, of this Christian life and in this uh, in this book uh, this Bible is uh, is taught by the Holy Spirit of God he instructs us he guides us he directs us he gives us understanding concerning uh, these things but the natural man does not have the Spirit of God living within him and so he cannot understand the depths uh, of the knowledge of the things of God in this life when you look at this conjunction that begins in verse number 22 it establishes a truth that there is a difference between the natural and the saved individual uh, or there is supposed to be amen Uh, the proceeding characteristics of the spirit they are completely different from the works of the flesh that we saw previously mentioned 
When you see this word but, it presents us with the truth that our natural course of action has been altered or completely redirected by the, one who, by the only one who can make such a change in a life. And that individual is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can make such a difference in an individual's life to bring about the, the contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit that are mentioned here in Galatians chapter number 5. That word, but it also establishes the preceding attributes as that they are contrary and in opposition to the works of the flesh. They are opposite of what the natural things of this world produce. May I say this? It won't take you long to turn on a television uh, to look at the, the characteristics and the attributes of those that live out into, in the world to see a difference between them and an individual that has been born again. Or at least it shouldn't. Amen. So we saw a, a change of course that happens in that conjunction. Let's also notice that there is a change in characteristics. Now for sake of time, I'm not going to deal with each and every one of these, uh, these attributes of the Spirit of God found in verse 22 and 23. Uh, but there are some things I'd like to look at. And you'll notice that it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You'll notice uh, that the word fruit is not plural there. And so what he is saying is this, uh, that this fruit, fruit of the Spirit, it is one fruit. It is one that is pro, uh, produced uh, by the Holy Spirit of God. Now the term fruit uh, that is used here is defined as that which is produced by the energy of the, of the living organism. Now may I say this, uh, the Holy Spirit of God that takes up an abode inside the heart of a believer, he is a living individual. May I say this, that God is not dead. He is still very much alive. He is still seated in the same place he was uh, when he created the earth and the heavens and all of these things. Uh, he's still in the same location uh, that he was uh, millennia ago and he will be for millennia from now. Uh, that he is still in the same place and that he is well able uh, to do exactly what he has done in the past and what he is going to do in the future. He is well, uh, he, is, he is alive. And so as you look at this, this term fruit, uh, that it is produced by a living organism. And that living organism in verse 22 is the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, one of the key attributes of fruit is that it contains the seed within itself. And may I say this, uh, you in and of your natural state are incapable of producing all of these things, these attributes of God uh, in and of yourself. Which what you must have is you must have the Holy Spirit of God uh, to produce uh, these, uh, these attributes in your life. You say, I can produce a couple of those. You may, but what you'll find oftentimes is that these attributes, when uh, they are work or a work of the flesh, they will come uh, with some caveats or some things uh, that, will, uh, that will hinder for the natural man is a sinful individual. The natural man is a sinner. It's what he is. It's what he does. That's the reason that you must be born again. That's the reason there must be a change in your life. And so we see uh, that these things, these characteristics, they are necessary uh, for the Holy Spirit to take up an indwelling in your life in order for you to produce or to show forth uh, these characteristics. By the way, these characteristics uh, that are mentioned here, these are the attributes of God Himself. Last time I checked, man's not very good at uh, simulating God. Amen. Simply stated, you cannot bear this fruit without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I would, I would also state this, that a life that is not surrendered to Christ will not bear this fruit either. Just because you've been born again does not mean you are not a carnal Christian. You say, what does that mean? A carnal Christian is an individual that has been born again and yet their life looks much like the life of a lost individual. It contains the same sins that were mentioned previously in the works of the flesh. It contains a life that does not bring honor and glory to God. May I say this, you can be born again and live a life that is not pleasing in the eyes of God. We would refer to that as being, living in a backslid state, meaning this, that God is not happy with where you are. But I am glad that God can fix that. 
And I'm glad you can come back to Him and He can rescue you from the sins that you are living in. Amen. I would, I, as we move on, unfortunately, there are many who attempt to convey these traits found in verses 22 and 20 through, uh, 23 through a fleshly means, but that avenue will never be adequate for you to show forth these things. Amen. Let's take love for a moment. I'm not going to deal with it entirely, but we understand this, that the love of God is far different than the love of man. Amen. The love of man, oftentimes it contains the ideas uh, of a give and take. But when we look at the love of God, we must look at Calvary. For Calvary is, is the established bar of the God's love. Uh, for He gave His only begotten Son uh, so that man might be born, uh, birthed into the family of God. Uh, how is God's love? God's love is a sacrificial love. It is a giving of self uh, completely uh, with nothing to gain in return. Now, man doesn't operate very well in that aspect. But that is the characteristic of the love of God. Let's look, letter C, at the change in composure found that there at the conclusion of verse number 23. He said this, against such there is no law. There is no law. Uh, there is no law which could or would uh, ban this fruit of the spirit. What you see in these things is this: uh, that these cannot be removed uh, from outside hindrances to your life. Can I tell you? You can exercise love no matter who has come in uh, come into your life or who is working against you. Can I tell you? You can have peace in your heart uh, because of the peace of God, in spite of your circumstances. Uh, but through the, the through the working of the Holy Spirit, you can be long suffering, uh, gentle. You can be good. Uh, you can have faith, meekness, and temperance. You can have joy uh, in these things, and you can have all of these. And listen, these can be outside of your circumstances. Now for many many individuals lives their circumstances dictate their actions. Can I tell you a Christian is supposed to be the same. We are supposed to be the same. I know it's difficult. God didn't tell you to be perfect, but we ought to be striving to be better. Amen. Amen. These were and are the attributes of the Lord and this is what he produces. And so we saw a conjunction that differentiates. Let's look at number two, a conduct that distinguishes there in verse number 24, a conduct that distinguishes. He would go on to say this, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Let's look at a mandate for operation. There is a necessity that is mentioned here at the, uh, the beginning of this word uh, verse. He said this, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. What he says is this, And they that are Christ. And so uh, there is a mandate that is a necessity in the life of an individual. And can I say this? The greatest need uh, for mankind, just like the, uh, the sisters that were just singing, is for mankind to be born again. You must become Christ. Uh, he has paid a great price for you. He gave his life for you. Can I tell you, this is the requirement for without salvation, uh, these other attributes and these other principles, uh, they are not available to any individual. And listen, this is something uh, that we'll say all often uh, because it is the greatest need in an individual's life it's that you must be born again you must be birthed into the family of God there must be a time in which the Holy Spirit of God he talks to you and he tells you that you are lost before him and he makes you uh, through conviction aware of your sinful state before him and your need of a savior in Jesus Christ you say what would you do then I, I would come and I would put my faith in Jesus Christ in the gospel you say what is the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to 1 Corinthians 15. And so that is the mandate of operation, for operation. It is the necessity uh, in an individual's life uh, that each and every one of us must be born again before we leave this life if we hope to, uh, to enter into heaven one of these days. That is the only avenue for man to go to heaven. Can I tell you, your good works won't get it done. Right. Who you are, who your family is, will not get it done. Right. You must be born again. Right. You say, who said that? 
Jesus Christ said that. It's a pretty good source, amen. A mandate for operation. Let's look at a mode of operation. He said this, these, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. One of the cruelest scenes in the history of mankind is Calvary. The suffering presented by our Savior is greater than words can describe. Can I tell you, I like the words to describe what God the Father put His Son through on Calvary for mankind. They sang, why He would ever love me. Can you think of, can, have you ever thought about this? Why God would give such a great gift for creatures who could give nothing back. For that's what God did for us. The writer here now states that those who are Christ, they have crucified the flesh. This is stated as a definitive act. This is an act that has already occurred in a saved individual's life. Uh, the interesting thing about crucifixion is this, that a man cannot crucify himself. The means is not possible. The action, the ability, you lack the ability to crucify yourself. Can I say you also dwell in a flesh that is against you, bringing it under subjection. What is required is that another accomplish this great work in you. The scene of Calvary is a scene of death, burial, and thankfully a resurrection on the third day. This is necessary in your life as well. This is the scene of your salvation. Uh, for Ephesians 2 tells us uh, that you were dead in trespasses and sins, and so your sin and uh, your trespasses have brought death in your life. In the eyes of God, an unsaved individual is a dead individual because they must be quickened or they must be made alive, and that is the need of mankind. Uh, the scene of your salvation is very similar to the scene uh, of what happened to Christ uh, on the cross there is a death there is a burial and there is a resurrection that must come uh, in that individual's life in your life and that is the very picture of believers baptism uh, once you get saved uh, baptism is a picture of the death the burial going under the water and then rising again as to the resurrection the testament of that of our Savior Jesus Christ they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. You say, what does that phrase mean? Can I tell you, in order for you to come to Christ, you are going to have to tell your flesh no and make a decision to come to Him. You'll have to because your flesh will say no every time. It has no interest in spiritual things. It has no interest in submitting itself to God. You we'll have to make a decision. This flesh, it refers to our sinful nature that we gained through Adam all the way back in Genesis chapter number 3. So we saw a mode of operation. Let's look at that is with the matched offenses there in verse number 24. And knowing that we have crucified the flesh, he says, with the affections and the lusts, and so what we see is this, with the death of the crucifixion comes the death of the desires of the flesh. Now we understand that the old nature is still a problem in our lives, but salvation gave us the ability to live a life that is pleasing in God's eyes. May I say this, without, without salvation you cannot live a life that is honorable or pleasing in the eyes of God. You say, why is that? Because God himself has established through his son an avenue for man to come in to fellowship uh, with him and that avenue is through Jesus Christ through Calvary and the cross and the shed blood of, uh, of the Son of God and so without that you cannot live a life that is pleasing in God's eyes. The attributes of the flesh are summed up, uh, summed up in these phrases. The affections and lust. Affections are those evil promptings that come from your flesh or the impulses. And the lust were those strong desires that proceed from your flesh. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Those things that come forth from the flesh that we know those things are not of God because they lead towards sin. As we dealt with last week, 
in the previous lesson, a lesson that I'll not rehash today, but I'll give you this point. The Holy Spirit of God will never lead you in a direction that leads towards sin. That would be contrary to His righteousness. Amen. He would never lead you in a direction or an avenue that will lead you towards sin. No, He always leads towards righteousness. And so let's look thirdly at a course that directs in verse number 25. A course that directs. Let's notice what is essential for life. He said this, if we live in the Spirit. Now for the third time in these verses uh, from 16 down through 26, we have seen a phrase that is included uh, in action associated with the Spirit. In verse 16, we are to walk in the Spirit. In verse number 18, we are to be led of the Spirit. And here in verse number 25, uh, we are to live in the Spirit. And so the if here, uh, it is a word that means sense or in view of the facts that are. The only way for us to have a life is to... is to have Jesus. Another part of that is the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, that takes up an abode in us when we got saved, as I've already stated. And so we saw what is essential for life. You must have the Spirit of God. But let's notice what is essential for likeness. He said this, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now the idea of walking in the Spirit now carries the idea of walking a course that is directed by the Holy Spirit of God. It is the ordering of the steps of your life. May I ask, who guides your life? Often it is ambitions and goals that direct an individual's life. And may I say this, I'm not saying that those things are inherently wrong. But have you even considered the direction the Lord wants you to go in? Has it even been a consideration Has it been something you've asked him? You say, you mean ask him in prayer? Yes, I mean talk to him and ask him what he desires for your life. Can I tell you the Holy Spirit of God was put inside of your heart at the moment you were saved, not just to seal you unto the day of redemption, but to lead you through this life. Amen. If God if God had no interest in you after salvation, then he would have taken you to heaven at that day. Uh, but there is an interest in you and in your life uh, that you live a life uh, that conforms to his image throughout all the rest of your days. Amen. So often, though, there are things in this life that are not sin when we look at even those ambitions and those goals. And yet they hinder the growth of the child of God. Hebrews 12 calls them weights that doth so easily beset. These things that weigh us down and they hinder our effectiveness for God. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We must be directed. Our path, our course, the Lord desires to lead His children. Let's look lastly at contentions of desire found in verse number 26. Contentions of desire. You'll see in this verse for the third and fourth times in this very chapter of Galatians chapter number 5 you'll find that phrase one another has been mentioned And what you see is this, that what you do affects others around you. There are consequences for the decisions that you make in this life. Amen. There are consequences. Decisions have consequences. Some of those consequences are for good. And some are for evil. Let's look at an imagined grandeur at the beginning of verse number 26. He said this, Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Vain glory can be simply defined. Strong's defined it as pride. He defined it as self-conceited. What you are looking at in this this vain glory is you are looking at the empty imaginations of grandeur. Brother Beckham, you ask about imaginations this morning in Sunday school and the fact of the matter is that each and every one of us have imaginations. We have things that we think of and can I tell you, oftentimes we see ourselves in a different light than how we actually are. Amen. 
You know how? Because what you think and then what you see in your mirror are often different. Often that mirror reflects something you didn't want to see, did it? Yeah. Empty imaginations. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Can I tell you, there are things that will hinder the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And one of those attributes is the sin of pride. The sin of pride. Can I tell you, it's one of the most devastating things in a man's life. It is a false image of self in your own mind. It is self-elevating. It is problematic. And it will tear down and wreck an individual's testimony, their life, their marriage, and every aspect of their life. But the fact of the matter is that's what sin does. That's what it's always done. That's what it will always do. We saw imagined grandeur. Let's look at irritating goals. He would move on to say this, provoking one another. Provoke means to irritate, to challenge another. What it brings is it brings the idea of supposed superiority. It is an idea that you are greater than those that are around you. Can I tell you what the Bible has to say about each and every one of us? In the book of Romans in chapter 3 and verse number 23, he said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the last time I checked, all means all. And so he included every one of us. He put us all in the same boat. None of us are greater than any other. For we are all sinners in need of the same Savior. To provoke, to irritate, to have a supposed superiority over others is a hindrance to the working of the Holy Spirit and His leadership in your life. And lastly, let's look at an indicative guidance. He said this, envying one another. Envy, you'll remember, was mentioned in that list of sins and the works of the flesh. Found in verse number 21, envyings. But it was linked right there with murders, drunkenness, revelings, all of these things. To envy is to bear in your heart not only the desire to have what another has, but to the extent that you'd rather have it and them not have it. It is the it is the desire in your heart to see another individual hurt that you might gain. You say, nobody would think like that. Do you live in the same world that I live in? Men do it every single day. They will make statements like this, don't let anybody stand in your way from the goals that you have in this life. That is a carnal attitude. It is a natural attitude attitude what you see is this that we as Christians we are to live verse 25 we are to live in the spirit and if you do so we are to walk in the spirit I made a simple statement when we dealt with this in verse number 16 and that statement was this if you are going to walk in the spirit then you're going to have to walk where the spirit is amen can I tell you the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil, the evil and the good, according to Proverbs 15 and verse number 3. Right. And so he sees the evil and the good, and so he sees every aspect of your life, every attribute, every everything, uh, every thought that is uh, in your heart, according to Hebrews 4. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Uh, he knows exactly what goes on in your mind. He knows, he knows those sins that nobody else knows about in your life. He knows those things that hinder your walk with God. But can I tell you, he's also the one that can help you get rid of those. He's still the only individual that can deal with the sins of mankind. And he created an avenue, and that avenue is Jesus Christ. He is the only avenue by which our sins can be dealt with and we can have victory over the sins of this world. Can I tell you, as long as you live in this world, sin is going to be an issue. 
But according to Romans chapter number 6, it's not supposed to have the victory over our life. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's have everybody stand this morning. Brother Beckham, Sister Abby, if y'all would make your way, Brother Connor.